This conference will now be recorded. All right, and so we are going to talk about adolescent brain development um, and really kind of look at this in terms of how this affects kind of the programming and the things that you guys are doing with young people. And so I always like to start this by talking about the fact that adolescence is not a set time frame. It is not, you know, from 12 to 18. It actually is a process, and it's this process of moving from childhood to becoming an adult. And all of the emotional, physical, and social development that goes into that process. So it is a fairly lengthy developmental period. It has a lot of variability depending upon um, the young person and their experiences and the background that they have and the type of support that they have. Um, and even changes with um, history and culture, because, you know, a long time ago, if you were 18, you were um, on your own. You were working, you had graduated from high school. Uh, some people went to college, but not very many. Most of them got a job and got married. Um, and started their adult life, and that has actually changed. There's, I think maybe 15 years ago or so, they added a new developmental period called emerging adulthood. That's from 18 to 24. Um, and so, you know, it, this stuff even changes based upon what's going on in culture and society. Given that, we are going to look specifically at adolescents um, and talk about this um, in terms of what's going on in the brain, but also in terms of the two developmental tasks that are really kind of the focus of adolescence. And this is based upon Eric Erickson's um, psychosocial development theory. Um, he was the first psychologist who said that the development happened beyond the age of 12. Up to that time, all of the developmental theory said, oh, when you're 12, you're an adult. Um, and you know the brain doesn't change anymore. We don't change. And we know that that's so not true right now. Um, and Erickson was, um, a, he lived and, and developed his theory back in the early 1900s. Um, so again, you know, he had the set range from 12 to 18. But again, back then at 18, you were, you know, you were starting your adult life. Um, so that now has changed. We know that this can go beyond that. But really when we talk about this, you know, when he talks about adolescent development and the developmental task, he talks about two really important things that have to happen. Um, and this is about figuring out who you are and how you fit into the world. And he called this identity, um, that you had to figure out, you know, what was important to you, what you wanted to do with your life, how you wanted to do that. And that had to be done before you could move on to the next stage, which was in developing intimacy with someone. So kind of sharing your life and who you are with someone. And when we fail to do this, if you're feel familiar at all with Erickson, there are always is developmental task and you either complete it, which is the identity, or there's kind of, the, you kind of get stuck, which for um, this would be role confusion, where you just really don't know who you are and what's going on. And this again is very individualized. And um, you know there are people who are well into their 20s still trying to figure out what they wanna do with their life, sometimes even 30s or more. Um, they don't know, they just don't know because they've never actually resolved this. They've never gone through the process of kind of thinking about it. And a lot of that has to do with um, just kind of opportunities and their environment and what they've kind of been forced into or not. So, you know, the two really big tasks when we think about adolescence um, is establishing identity and then developing autonomy. And we can see this if you, you know, I have four boys. Um, they're all adult children right now. My oldest is 34. Four. God, it's crazy. Um, and my youngest is, will be 19 this month. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. And you guys are, you know, working with an age range where you're going to see kids actually working on figuring out who they are, what's important to them, what they want to be. And a lot of times they start this in middle school um, and junior high with just kind of trying on different personalities. You know, so they may go through a goth phase, they may go through a sports phase, 
Um, you know, they just try on all of these different things to kind of figure out what fits for them. And that's really, really good. There's another theory that talks about identity formation. And, and you know, the basis of that theory is kids have to have a chance. We all have to have a chance to explore what we want to do and what fits for us before we really kind of settle and decide. Um, and a lot of times for adolescents, especially young adolescents, this looks like rejection of everything that um, their parents are because they don't want to be a repeat of you know who their parents are. They want to be their own person. And so this can be a really, really difficult time for parents or for adults who've been close to this young person um, because they tend to pull away and they want to explore other things. Um, and I always would tell parents, you know, this is this is normal and you want your kids to go through the exploration period. It is very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable for the young person. It's very uncomfortable for the adults who are in the lives of that young person because it, it, they're just not sure. And that anxiety, um, you know, kind of produces some some real, you know, I guess, discomfort for everybody involved. Um, but once they have the opportunity to do that, they can you know, try those different things on and they can kind of settle into who they want to be. And I remember this very, very clearly with my oldest, maybe because he was my first one, but he had a really hard time um, in junior high just trying to figure stuff out. There were a lot of, some, you know, there's some social stuff going on. Um, and <laughs> when Chris wasn't happy, nobody was happy <laughs> in the house. Um, and it was difficult, it was hard. But he got to high school and he really started to kind of settle in. I think high school gave him the opportunity to meet other people and to try on new different things um, and, and different interests for him. And I remember him just really settling into this, this, this really distinct memory of us being at the bank. And, you know, it, kids kind of become little... Um, almost like little robots in middle school. They don't want to do anything that's different from anybody else. Um, it was like kind of cookie cutter thing. Um, and, and he was a, you know, always been this, you know, really kind of cool kid with all these different interests in it. So that was a real change for us. And then we were at the bank and he did something in public that was just really, really silly and was okay with that. And I thought, oh, there he is. There's my kid back. <laughs> and he just had become comfortable in his skin and it took a little bit. And so you'll see that with kids, you know, as they struggle through this. And again, this can be um, a lengthy, lengthy process if they don't have the opportunity to, to explore different things and they don't have the support. So as adults, the things that we can do is to understand that this is what they have to go through, that this is a very normal process. If you are that important adult, so maybe you're an older brother, older sister, um, you know, an aunt, uncle, uh, whatever, and you have this close relationship and they pull away um, and they kind of dismiss the things that you're interested in, that is a normal part of this. But if you have a really good relationship, and I would say this to parents, they come back. They come back to you. They decide that, you know, the interest that you have, they want to have too because it's their choice and it's something that they want to share with you. Um, and so just understand, provide them with all of the different opportunities to try this stuff out. I used to tell parents when I was a counselor at the YSB, um, you know, if hair color is the biggest thing that you have to worry about, you're golden. It is okay. You know, don't fight about what they're wearing to school. Um, don't fight about the color of their hair. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, kids can't get piercings and tattoos without parental permission until they're older and they can kind of fi they figure some of this stuff out. Um, but, you know, that's okay. You know, if, let them explore those things. You know, don't make them, if, you know, I my, my oldest, again, my oldest, um, thought he was going to go out for football. I knew that was not a good idea. I knew it wasn't going to stick, but that's okay. He went out for football and he lasted all of a month and then we were done and I didn't make him stick with it. Sometimes parents would say, well, you made a commitment and you have to stick to this. Well, in adolescence, they're trying this stuff on and it's not really that kind of commitment. Um, my second son, even though I knew this stuff, he, he thought maybe he was going to um, go into music. And so I bought a $500 trumpet 
that then sat in my closet for a year after six months. I finally sold it um, or, you know, because he decided, no, six weeks, it wasn't even six months, it was six weeks. He's like, yeah, this is not for me. So he's, you know, rent the stuff, don't buy the stuff, um, but provide them with those opportunities. And you guys have the opportunity to do that at the shelter. Um, that's one of the things that I loved about being there. And I used to do programming we could provide them, sometimes we provide kids with the opportunities that they've never had before um, and bring people in to talk about their careers um, so that they kind of got an opportunity just to really kind of explore all different kinds of things. And, and you could just, it was really cool to watch when something clicked for a kid and their eyes just kind of lit up and that was it, this was them and, and, and it really made a difference in, to their lives and all of a sudden school became more important and you know they started to study because they had something they wanted to do. So helping them find those things or things that we can do, you can do at the shelter um, and really support this establishment of identity. Um, things like you know letting them decorate their room as long as it's appropriate the way that they want to the short time that they're there um, just that different type of expression where they can, you know, kind of be themselves and explore those things. Once they figure it out, and sometimes these things happen, they have to happen um, at the same time, um, but typically right around, I would say maybe ju the junior year of college is when kids start to um, get their driver's license. They move, if they kind of figured that out about who they are, they move toward this um, autonomy and independence. And so when we think again, if we think about adolescence and those two tasks, establishing identity and then becoming independent and establishing their own autonomy, those are huge developmental tasks. Um, and so kids have a lot on their mind. You know, and this is stuff that, because you know, it is something that um, we do as a society, you know, so you need to start getting a job. We start asking them questions. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do when you graduate? What are you, are you going to go to college? What are you going to major in? We're asking questions that force them to think about this stuff. And I did not know this until maybe about nine months or so ago. Maybe it's been a little bit longer than that. But when kids go into, when they start high school, they have to choose a um, their their kind of graduation path, which I think is, is way, way too young, way too young, because they're still figuring this stuff out. So they can kind of get locked into stuff. Um, but they're, you know, kind of we're forcing that a little bit earlier. But they do want to kind of establish their own independence. We see this with older adolescents as they spend more and more time out of the house. Um, maybe they spend more and more time in their rooms and not with the adults in their lives because they want that space and they want that mobility because again they're figuring out how am i going to do this on my own when i am you know when i don't have mom and dad to rely on anymore how am i going to manage all of this stuff and so they begin if they can't um establish that independence financially most kids are still they're not going to establish it in terms of leaving the house um, they so they can't establish that physical distance what they do is they start to establish an emotional distance and so they kind of pull away from parents as being the main primary emotional support they turn to peers a little bit more um, and so again this is very normal this is to be expected um, i always would tell you know again tell the parents don't be hurt this is what they are supposed to be doing at this age support that independence when it, things are, when they need you, they will come back if you have a really good relationship, um, and they do. Um, and so again, we can support that as adults by providing them with that space, by allowing them that mobility. There, you know, if kids are in the shelter and they are looking um, to get a job, then we can support them in that job search and then how to um, not only get a job, but keep a job. We were always we were always practiced um, interview skills um, and kids would get the job and then they would lose the job because they would come. I remember this one girl. She would <laughs> she she presented very, very well. She got a job really, really easy. Um, and then she ran into trouble because she she came back and she would complain that 
you know, the supervisor kept telling her what to do. <laughs> she didn't want to be told what to do. We had to talk about that. That's part of the job. That's what that person, that person's job is to tell you what to do. Your job is to listen to them. Um, and so just working through all of these different things, um, allowing them again, that personal expression when we can um, and supporting them in ways to emotionally distance and, and safely try on taking on their own independence. And again, um, you know, whether that's through letting them take the transit to or from, you know, work or, um, you know, if they have to take the, the transit system from school to their job, um, again, allowing them that independence and figuring how to out how to do this stuff on their own in a very, very safe setting. Um, and so we still provide that structure as adults. We still provide that structure. We still provide that support um, to do this, but we have to allow them to make choices. And that's sometimes one of the hardest things to do as an adult is to allow that young person to go into a situation where they potentially could make a difficult, the wrong choice that would have consequences, but trust that we've given them the skills and that they will choose to do the right thing. And even if they don't, <laughs> be their support to help guide them as to what maybe they could have done differently, but just allowing them, sometimes we have to allow them to make mistakes so that they can learn. There are some kids who just learn by making mistakes. You can tell, tell them, tell them, tell them, it's not gonna make any difference until they make a mistake and they learn on their own. Um, but were their support um, to kind of pick up and, and help them figure out what else they could have done differently. So these are two huge tasks. You know, big things that they have to do, uh, you know, we're, we're talking social and um, really social and emotionally um, becoming responsible and independent. And the brain has a, um, a very, brain development has a very real impact on that. So before we go, I forgot I had the slide in here. So this is gonna be your turn. I'm gonna open this so you guys can either type this into the chat feature and I will keep a look, an eye on that or just unmute yourself one at a time and talk about ways that as, you know, as an adult um, staff person in the shelter, how you guys can support either opportunities to explore identity formation or their own independence. I would say with programming, um, I know COVID has put a huge damper on this, but we can continue to have um, outside presenters coming in, just kind of like you mentioned, introducing new careers, taking kids to Ivy Tech to learn about some things they offer, you know, offer there, IU, things they offer there. Um, but yeah, having those, you know, different perspectives and um, whether it be secondary education or trade school or uh, whatever, you know, skill, something that people learn, um, just introducing those opportunities to kids while they're here for their short stays. Yes, yes, yeah, thank you. Lauren said, um, lead new focus activities. Ashley said, opportunities for crafts and sports exploration. Um, again, visits to Ivy Tech. Um, so you guys are doing this. We've done this, you know, at the shelter. Um, for a really long time, and that's just really a great opportunity that we have. Um, so continue to do those things, look for other ways to do that. Let's see, um, also modeling our own, yes, different personalities and identities is a really good way to do that. If they, you have good relationships, kids looked up to you, they do look to those older um, adult, you know, kind of older adults or peers to kind of think, figure things out as well. You know, observational learning, how is this working for that that person? And so, you know, making sure that we're doing that. Let's see. Uh, yeah, and James says he really likes that. <laughs> yeah, because it is, it's a great, and that's one of the other things, if you have a really diverse staff with lots of different interests and you bring those interests to the shelter and you share those interests with kids, it's just another way for them to learn about new and different things. And it may be the first time that they've had that opportunity um, to do so. All right, so let's dive into brain development. 
so um, this is a fairly new science when we think about um, neuroscience and, and adolescent brain development. And I predate it, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm older than the science because I remember going, I remember going to college and I was so excited to learn about all of these different things and then so disappointed that the classes didn't give me the information that I wanted. Um, and so I've kind of kept up and dived in, uh, dove into this stuff as it become available, but um, probably adolescent brain development really took off in the, it started maybe sometime in the 80s, but it really took off in the 90s. Um, mostly because there was a researcher um, at, he's now at the national, he's like the medical and in MH, I don't know, whatever, but he's somewhere, he's, he's federal invest, um, scientist. And he was studying, his name is Jay Geed, and he was studying um, ADHD. And he was looking at brains with MRIs. Of course, we haven't had the technology you know, until the last like 30 years or 40 years or so to even look at the brain. Um, but he was using MRIs to look at the brain to see if how the brain of kids who had ADHD were different than the brains of kids who didn't or adults. And he really noticed that the brain of adolescents was just drastically different than the brains of adults. And before that, you know, it was kind of assumed that the brain was, was the same. Um, if you were 12 or so, then your brain was the same because at age 12, your brain is the same. It's, it reaches it, its adult weight. Okay, so you, your brain doesn't grow, it doesn't get any bigger in terms of weight, but there, the changes that happen inside the brain, um, we did, couldn't see before. And he was one of the first to kind of notice this. And, and he started to study this, so he dropped it, and he didn't really finish his ADHD stuff, but he really took on adolescent brain development. And, um, and the, the differences explained so much that this just science really took off. So we now know that the brain is not done at 12. All you have to do is raise kids to know that the brain's not done at 12 or be around kids to know that, but um, the brain is not done at 12. There are some really significant differences in an adolescent brain and the development that it goes through to reach adulthood. And this is not done until the mid, this says early and the most recent research now says mid to late 20s, that there's still development that happens. And looking at the pictures in the gallery, it looks like we have some folks who are whose brains are still developing, who still fit that, you know, under you know that mid to to late twenty kind of range. And the last part of the brain that develops is the prefrontal lobe. So the the frontal lobes are right here um, in your, at your forehead. They're responsible for all of our higher emotional. Um, control and all of what we think of as logic or kind of rational um, decision making, goal setting, priority setting, all of those things, all of that works in the prefrontal lobes. And this is the last part of the brain to develop. And you go, okay, so that automatically makes a lot of sense, right? We know that the part of the brain that's the last to develop is the part that's responsible for impulse control and you know deciding right or wrong and understanding consequences um, then that kind of makes sense explaining some of this adolescent behavior and the brain develops from the back to the front anyway so the the back part of the brain is called usually called the hind brain um, control it has all of those structures that control things like breathing and heart rate um, and you know blood pressure that basically are survivors survival skills and then it, we go to the midbrain, and the midbrain is is like right in the center of the brain, and that is where um, kind of homeostasis, so body temperature, weight, um, motivated behaviors like eating, drinking, um, and, and and sex behaviors are there in the midbrain as well as all of our emotions that develops, and then the prefrontal, and then the cortex, um, which is responsible for that higher decision making. So kind of key is that when we reach adolescence, the part of the brain that is responsible for our emotions is fully developed, but the part of the brain that is responsible for controlling those emotions is not yet developed. 
We also have neural growth and neural growth is, it's super cool to see kind of the patterns of, so the neurons are the cells in the, in the brain. Everybody knows that, right? I don't know how basic to get, um, but the neurons are the cells in the brain and they continue to grow. Again, this is something that we have learned in the last 30 years is that, you know, we don't have a finite number of neurons. They will continue to grow and develop as long as we are alive at different rates. But when our brains are, when we are um, in development, going through periods where we have to learn a lot, then we do this kind of abundance of neural growth. And so this is birth three months and 15 months, but we kind of see this pattern repeat itself over and over again, where we get this super abundance of neurons. Um, and at 15 months, what are kids learning to do typically around 15 months? That's a major developmental task. I'll ask my parents or any you know, early development people. What are kids talking? Thinking? That's right, talking. Okay. And that is a huge, huge cognitive developmental shift. And the brain is ready for that. And so we see this kind of neural growth at, at toddlerhood. We see it again, four to six. We see it again at seven to 11. So that's like kind of the elementary schools. And then something happens in adolescence that's just a little bit different. We have that growth, like I said, um, from seven to 11, it typically is the temporal lobes. Temples are, you know, right, temporal is right by the temples. That's why it's called that. Um, but this is the area that is responsible for uh, learning and our memories. In the temporal lobes, we'll find our hippocampus. And that's the part of the brain that really is responsible for all of kind of our school learning. And um, we do, and we have that overabundance between seven and 11. So pre-adolescence, we get this overabundance because there's so much information that kids have to absorb. If we think about everything that you learn in elementary school, you learn to read, you learn to do your basic math skills. We're also learning how to get along with others. So there's a lot of social development. Um, we're learning how to control our um, emotions. A lot of times this is the first time that kids really have to, um, you know, delay gratification to sit and wait. You know, they just can't go off. So lots of skills that they have to learn during this time. The brain has that overabundance of neural growth so that they can actually soak up that learning and that can be solidified and we hold on to that. Um, and then we reach adolescence. And instead of, so we have, so this is at birth, this is at seven. So you again see that kind of dense neural growth that happens. Um, and then instead of this, you know, so we have that overabundance. And then when we get to adolescence, what happens is what's called synaptic pruning. And this is when every, all of those neurons, all of those connections that haven't been used between that seven to 11 age, um, you know, and continue not to get used as you go into adolescence begin to be pruned away. So this works at the same principle as gardening does. If we have any gardeners um, in the group, if you have a fruit tree, if you have a rose bush, um, it is very important to prune off, to clip off all of those dead, unused branches. Because what happens when you do that? Do we have any gardeners? Anybody <laughs> who knows what happens when you prune off even sometimes healthy branches? <laughs> but def well, definitely dead. dead. Go ahead. This, this is my favorite metaphor in your training, Robin, because <laughs> you like for tomato plants, for example, um, the, there are certain ones that if you don't prune them, then you'll have a lot less fruit on them um, because you or if you let um, half alive or or partially, you know, dead um, branches stay, then the plant puts so much energy into healing them that it doesn't have energy left for other things, which is a really awesome metaphor for thinking about brain development. Right. Because, and when you actually do that pruning, then what happens is what's left over is better, right? You get better fruit. If it's a rose bush, you get 
more, you know, prettier flowers that are more fragrant. Um, and so that's kind of the same thing that happens. That pruning happens in the brain to allow it to be more efficient. So this is, you know, a, a significant change in brain development that happens in adolescence. Instead of this overabundance, we actually get this pruning that happens that allows the brain to be more efficient. What is left over is going are the things that are used. And, the, and you know, we're going those neural connections and those neural pathways that we are going to be able to tap into quickly and efficiently. And this is going to be true for whatever focus we want to be, you know, we want to have. So I always joke that this is what my brain looks like in the math section um, of my brain. And this is what it looks like in the psychology section of the brain. <laughs> I don't like math, so I don't use those. Um, so we got, you know, it's not really that bad. But, you know, we do have, we hold on to those denser connections that we're using so that it is more efficient. And so you actually have a loss in the gray matter, which are the neurons of the brain um, in adolescence. Now, what, what, you, what it, that's replaced with is what's called white matter, which are all of the uh, um, kind of support cells in the brain. They're usually called glial cells that allow us to function more efficiently. Um, so what we want to do as adults is we want kids to hold on to those connections that allow them to be successful. We want to capitalize, again, back go back to those opportunities on the opportunity to learn how to cook. This is why we really should be introducing foreign languages in elementary school. Don't wait till, don't wait until high, middle school, junior high or high school because it's harder to hold on to that stuff after that. Introduce it early. Um, music, whether it's arts, it could be, you know, crafts, it could be, you know, kind of hands-on stuff. Introduce these things early so that they're actually utilizing those brain structures um, and those neural connections, and they're going to hold on to that information um, so that the really important stuff that we want them to know, um, and, and this is going to work in terms of emotional control, in terms of interpersonal skills and communication skills. We want to practice this stuff and give kids the opportunity to do this stuff um, on a regular basis so that they hold on to that information. And, and I, you know, I, I, I am going to, I didn't normally do that. I normally do this at the beginning, um, but this is all based upon kids who come from a supportive, nurturing background. So trauma is, if you've got a kid who comes from a trauma background, this is going to delay all of this stuff. So just kind of understand and know that. Um, but we can still provide these opportunities for the, to, to create that growth and to maintain those. Another change that happens in the adolescent brain um, that we can take advantage of is something that's called long-term potentiation. And so this is based upon communication in the brain. So um, communication in the neuron itself is electrical, but communication between the neurons, which is called a synapse, that's what the space is um, between the, the, um, the neurons, this is chemical. So this is a chemical relationship from neuron to neuron. And that electrical stimulation in the neuron is going to release a neurotransmitter, which floats across the synapse, and then it's um, absorbed by a receptor on the new neuron. This is called the postsynaptic neuron. And then it's going to trigger that kind of electrical um, communication in this neuron, and it just kind of passes on, passes on that way. Long-term potentiation is when we are using those parts of the brain, when we are utilizing on a regular basis that neural pathway, the neurons that are um, along that neural pathway, whether it's for math, whether it's for reading, whether it's for um, you know, a, an artistic skill, whatever, um, then they, they, after stimulation, this is repeated stimulation, we actually grow more neuro, neuro, um, neurotransmitters to be released, and this postsynaptic cell actually grows more receptors. And so this is going to speed the communication between neurons so that you have kind of, um, again, it's going to take less information. There's, um, and 
they're just going to be more receptive and they're going to be more connected so it doesn't and and they're going to be able to communicate more now what's interesting about long-term potentiation is this does happen kind of again very naturally in adolescence um, it can happen at any age with repeated stimulation so the more you use that neural pathway the more it's going to look like this as opposed to this again this is my math and this is my psychology um, but the more you use it you're more you're going to be able to stimulate that um, communication between neurons but this is very susceptible to i don't remember what my next yes okay it is very susceptible to risks so long-term potentiation um, can be influenced by external and internal um, threats such as alcohol and marijuana um, stimulants and attention deficit. So ADHD um, will affect how receptive our neurons are, how receptive they are to releasing neurotransmitters, how receptive they are to accepting things. So, um, you know, and um, typically alcohol and marijuana are going to depress the um, long-term potentiation effects on both neurons and not just one. Stress also affects long-term potentiation and gets in the way. And all of this stuff gets in the way of long-term potentiation. Sleep deprivation, multitasking. Most of these things, again, are going to depress the activity of one or both of the neurons in this process. The only thing that's different is nicotine. And what nicotine does is it actually creates new receptors in the brain specifically for nicotine. Um, so, and it does this at um, an exponential rate in adolescence than it does in any other time. So I always talk about the 5, 15, 25 rule. And this is true not only for nicotine, but also other substances. Anyone remember, because there's several of you who've heard this more than once, the 5, 15, 25, anyone remember what that is? Apparently not. I, I can't remember. I just know the gist was don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's so that was what I remember. <laughs> but I do, yes, I do remember hearing that from you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so the rule is, if you start a substance at the age of 15, you are five times more likely to become addicted to that substance than if you wait until 25 to start it. So again, if you wait, if you started at 15, you're five times more likely to be addicted than if you wait until you're 25. And all of that has to do with the vulnerability of the adolescent brain and the fact that there are significant changes that are going on in this time frame that have lifelong impact. So if you think about you know, people who smoke and who struggle with um, you know, cigarette and ni nicotine addiction, um, a lot of times when you ask them when they started smoking, they started smoking as teenagers and it becomes much more difficult to, to kick that habit um, if you start it at an earlier age than not. So all of these things get in the way and it's important to help kids understand this, that you know what's going on in their brain and what they do during adolescence um, can have lifelong impact. All right, so the last like real change that happens in the adolescent brain that's different than other developmental periods is the fact that all of this synaptic growth that I talked about um, is in the adolescent is excitatory. So all of that neural growth is ready to make things happen. It's ready to, to create action, to create a response, um, as opposed to being inhibitory. So if we think about, you know, let's go back to toddlerhood, which is the other time that is the only other time um, besides prenatal, that we experience such significant changes in the brain. So toddlerhood and adolescence um, are, are very, they mirror each other in terms of adolescent brain development, all of the stuff that has to happen. But in toddlerhood, what they're learning to do, this, this neural growth is inhibitory. It's about 
waiting. It's about self-control. You know, think about toddlers are learning, you know, how to recognize body signals to, to toilet train. You know, and we have to teach toddlers to wait. And so they're, it's all in and not to hit. It's all about control. It's all about not doing something. But with adolescents, that neural growth is excitatory. It is about making things happen. And so we get a lot of behavior out of this excitatory neural development, right? So understanding that, again, just makes all kinds of difference when we think about explanation for behavior that happens in adolescence because it is excitatory. And we can direct that excitatory neural development um, in the ways that we want to. So we can direct this by helping them practice kind of this, you know, just really thoughtful um, cognition that we're purposeful about. We want to develop that excitatory um, experience in the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that is responsible for decision making and for impulse control and controlling those emotions. And we can do that by asking leading questions, right? So if you want this to happen, what do you think you need to do? You know, um, I wanna go do this. Okay, so what needs to happen before you can reach that goal? If, you know, you want to, I don't know, you're interested in a, they're interested in a, you know, a, a romantic, per, you know, target. What do they need to happen? What are considerations that they need to think about? You know, if they just go up and say, hey, you're hot, you wanna go out? Well, what's the likely response <laughs> that's gonna happen? Um, what well, might be another way to, to, to get what they want um, that's, uh, you know, more likely to have someone agree with, you know, to go along with that? Ask these questions, you know, the log logical considerations. When I was at the, when I worked at YSB, we had a youth group that um, it's called Youth in Action. And they did a lot of events for um, the high school kids in their area. So we had kids from all three high schools and they just put on events usually once a month um, for, for high schoolers after hours. And we would brainstorm and, and they'd come up with all of these activities. It was interesting as the adult to um, help them explore their ideas without popping their, without bushing the bubble, right? Because sometimes they'd come up with really crazy stuff. And we could, as you know, as the adult, we didn't, I didn't want to be like, no, we can't do that. We'd have to say, okay, so what would need to happen? What do you, you know, what are possible consequences? What would have to be in place? And then they would come up with their own, okay, so, you know, maybe it's not a really good idea to hold a paintball contest, um, you know, on property, on, on YSB property, because, <laughs> right? <laughs> because of you know all the paint and who's going to clean it up and you know and you know they come up with other maybe someone could get hurt maybe we would have to have security there but uh, letting them come up with those ideas on their own and then then just kind of pull that back but you do that by asking the questions they come up with those leading questions allow them to come up with that and when you do that you are actually creating the activity that neural activity between what they want to do, the limbic system, because they get really excited about it, and the prefrontal cortex, um, the thinking part of it. And so we're really you know, creating that neural pathway that allows them to do that and really focusing that excitatory growth in the area that we want to grow, which is the thinking part of the brain, by, just by asking these questions. All right. So here's another opportunity for you guys to talk about um, how we can capitalize, how we can help reduce reduce the risks that, that I talked about um, and promoting that thoughtful process. So again, you guys unmute or type into the chat feature. This gives me a chance to take a drink. Get my caffeine this morning. All right, so got something in the chat feature. Yeah, psychoeducation. I loved doing focus because it was an opportunity to introduce a lot of this stuff and help them think about that stuff. What else?
Oh, come on. I can I can add something um, not with um, the shelter, but I, I guess Monroe County Youth Council is similar to youth in action that you were talking about. And so like to help promote the the processing, um, you know, to reground and OK, I hear all these ideas coming up. How does this connect with your original goal because of that? Yeah, that all those great ideas, they can take take you far away <laughs> from what you were originally <laughs> planning. So I engaged in some of that in a in a meeting yesterday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ashley also puts allowing input or control when possible. That is huge for adolescents. Remember, they're working on autonomy and independence. And so that will really grab their attention. Um, James says, asking them how well a, <laughs> A similar idea they tried worked out. Um, and so again, just, yeah, and, and maybe, you know, what else they could do differently, implementing these opportunities to learn daily skills. That was always something that was really interesting when I was at the shelter, um, you know, because sometimes it was the first time kids ever had um, more than just a blanket and a pillow to sleep on a mattress. So, you know, making beds and how to cook and all of those things. Megan says for promoting thoughtful processing, even starting encouraging youth to ask questions and have reflective conversations, creating safe places to try and fail and sometimes try and succeed. And Lauren, that's a great, great point because we think if we fail, it's done. And that's not true. Failure is the opportunity to learn and to try another way. And as adults, I think we often try to make sure kids succeed every time and that's folks that's not the real world <laughs> that is just not the real world and actually what's super interesting is some of the more recent brain research that i've looked at um, talks about the fact that when we actually have some challenges and struggles our brain we are healthier when we've had those struggles and challenges and learned how to overcome them than if we've never had any challenges at all. So, you know, learning challenges, um, learning, you know, how, how to fail and how to deal with failure and overcome and then learn new ways. All of these things are very supportive, not only of brain development, but also um, all of this stuff affects you physically as well. Um, so if people who have had challenges and had support to successfully overcome them are actually physically healthier and their immune systems work better than people who have faced no challenges whatsoever. So that's a, a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, let's talk about those, that prefrontal lobe. Yeah, because this is the part that we really want kids to develop. This is the, this is the thing that we, if, when we think about what we're doing with kids, if you think about this in terms of, is this going to promote prefrontal cortex development, then you're on the right track. Because that's what you guys have the opportunity to do as you're working with kids, is to kind of make those connections. And adolescents are not very, very good at emotional control. Is that a surprise to anybody? Hopefully not. <laughs> adolescents aren't very good at emotional control. And this is true for adolescents who come from supportive, nurturing um, backgrounds, because this is based upon how the brain develops. And if you guys remember, the hind, the hind brain develops first, has to, and then the midbrain. So this is the limbic system down in here, and then the prefrontal cortex last. And in adolescence, the limbic system is fully developed. We have the hypothalamus, you have the pituitary gland, which is basically the master grant, gland because it controls the release of all of the hormones. Um, we have also, it doesn't show it in here, but the amygdala, which is a teeny tiny structure that is responsible for emotional control, some learning. Um, um, it holds memories for emotional memories, especially if they're threatening. Um, it is the amygdala that kind of starts that whole process of fight or flight. Um, and so all of our emotions, our reward center is in the limbic system as well. 
So it's this is fully developed in adolescence before the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for emotional control. All right. And we see this. We see this in the behavior. We see this in the fact that kids just really get worked up and, and then everything's all there. Um, even when maybe we think it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way because this is fully developed before prefrontal cortex is. And this is based upon experience. So do y'all know adults who also don't have emotional control? It's because they haven't had the experience to learn how the, to develop prefrontal cortex um, to allow that. It's based upon experience. So as I said, the amygdala is this teeny, I can't see, here we go, right here. It's on the end of the hippocampus. It's a teeny tiny structure. I actually have two, one in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. But it's responsible for processing sensory information and assigning it emotional importance. Is this information coming in that is something that I need to pay attention to because it potentially threatens me. It potentially threatens my survival. It potentially can create harm. It potentially can lead to rewards and something that is in my benefit. And if it is, that information is, then it's going to kind of it's kind of trigger that emotional component. We assign emotions to it. If it's something that's frightening, like I said, it will trigger the sympathetic nervous system, start the fight or flight response. Um, and it develops and is fully developed before the prefrontal cortex. I will say that for young people who have a trauma background, who have come from homes that are abusive, um, this is more fully developed. It is bigger, the amygdala is bigger. It is more responsive and, and that's because it's had to be. If they come from a, a, background, a home that has been abusive, the amygdala has just had to have had to pay more attention and it has more things to worry about. And so it's going to be bigger. And so you get that immediate kind of emotional response. What we see because of this is a lot of really what we consider dramatic behavior from teenagers, right? Things are the best thing in the world or the absolute worst thing in the world. And that is because, again, this is fully developed and teenagers experience emotions more intensely than any other age group because of this, because of that really rich development and that excite. Again, remember, it's excitatory development. So when they experience stuff, it really is the worst thing in the world or the, the best thing in the world to them because they experience this so much more intensely. And emotional states, especially negative emotional states, last longer in teenagers. So it takes them longer to get over things because this area is fully developed, it's fully responsive, it's overly sensitive, um, and you get these behaviors. Teenagers are also very egocentric. And what that means is that it's they're self-focused. And so you often will get um, kids who say you can't, you can't possibly understand. There's no way you understand. You know, this is they feel like things are very specific to them, that no one else feels the same way that they do. Again, they don't have that opportunity to engage prefrontal cortex and kind of see patterns of other people's behaviors. Um, and so they feel like no one can possibly understand that everyone's looking at them. There's this heightened level of self-consciousness. This is particularly true um, in um, element or middle school age, right? Junior high. They feel like everybody's looking at them, everybody's judging them, and no one can possibly understand. And so that is a, it's, they have all of these overwhelming feelings um, and they feel isolated because of this personal fable, because they feel like no one else understands or could possibly know what they're going through. So what can we do? As adults, one of the best things that we can do is listen. And I mean, and I mean, really listen. Don't try to fix stuff. Don't try to make them feel better. 
Um, you know, don't, you know, when kids are talking about, and it's hard because when kids are talking about difficult things, it's hard for us to hear. Um, but sometimes they just need us to listen. I'm a fixer. I think most of us in this field are fixers. <laughs> That's why we're here. Um, but sometimes kids just need to express and they just need to, to kind of be out there. And sometimes silence your, your presence, but your silent presence is the best thing that you can give them because they feel heard. They don't feel like it. Sometimes when we try to fix things, that sends the message that something's wrong and something's wrong with them when really they just need to express stuff. Um, so really be there, be present in the moment, turn the cell phone off, um, you know, just kind of pay attention to them, listen. Sometimes you can reflect back to make sure that you're understanding things correctly. Um, that shows them that you are really listening. It gives them the opportunity to correct you. If you're um, understanding something, you know, in a, in, incorrectly, so it just kind of be there with them and let them um, kind of talk about it and express stuff. I, like I said, I'm a fixer, so um, I always, with my boys, have to ask, "Do you need me to? Do you do you want solutions, or do you just want me to listen?" I have to ask that question because I tend to want to give solutions and give advice, but sometimes they don't want that. <laughs> they just need me to listen. They just need me to shut shut up and let them kind of talk about things. All right, support or solutions. Yeah, and there's a different, I mean, there's a huge difference. And, and this is an age where kids want to find their own solutions. Remember, autonomy is what they're working toward and that independence. Um, so we can be supportive versus try to fix stuff. One of the other things that works really, really well, and I love this is, so there are neurons in our brains that are called mirror neurons, and they are responsible for reading, they kind of help read other people and um, create empathy, and sometimes create that kind of same emotion. How many of you guys cry when other people cry? Do we have criers on here? <laughs> That no one is going to admit to being a crier when you're watching a, a sad movie and somebody anytime somebody cries on TV shows or whatever I cry it's really hard like you know um, it's really hard for me there's a mirror neurons and I'm really paying attention and it creates this synchronicity right um, and so we can use this we can use the fact that we have these mirror neurons and unconsciously we mimic and we and we mirror. <laughs> Lauren says it's over overactive tear ducts. So you have overactive mirror neurons. That's what it is. You have overactive. You're just super empathetic. Um, and, you know, and, and but we can use this to our advantage as well because it is unconscious. And as people tend to get excited, um, they become more demonstrative. So I use my hands a lot. I don't know if you guys can see that as much. You know, but I do use my hands a lot. If I get really excited, I talk faster. I tend to talk louder as well um, if I get really excited. And it's all unconscious. Um, but if I want to calm someone down, and I did this with my oldest because he's very, very much like his mother. Um, and, and he was very, very passionate. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> um, but very passionate as a, as a, a, a teenager he would start to get worked up and I would start to get quiet and I would become softer and I would speak slower and I would make sure that I controlled my own gestures and just kind of calm down. And as I did that, he would come down as well. So when you're working with people, if you're working, and this is true for anybody, it does not just kids. If you're working with someone and they really start to get worked up and you know that if they're really starting maybe to, to kind of get really upset, we can use the synchronicity to kind of bring them back down. It happens unconsciously. They don't, they're, they're not aware of it, but as we get quieter and as we get slower, then they'll kind of calm down as well. 
as we get excited, other people get excited too. So we really do match that and we can use this to our advantage. We can create this downtime, right? You have to have, because it is exhausting to think that people are looking at you all the time, um, you know, to kind of feel like no one else understands, that's not a, a fun place to be. So kind of creating that downtime for kids so they can just kind of chill and then help them find if they're, you know, maybe they come back from school and they, you know, they're upset because they think that somebody has been talking about them. Um, just again, go back to that thoughtful processing and help them explore. Now, how do you know? You know, what was going on? What made you think that? What, what might be other explanations? Because they tend not, remember they're egocentric and they tend to think it's about them when it could be about something completely different that didn't have anything to do with them. So sometimes we have to move them out of themselves to help find those alternative explanations. Because they're not very good at reading emotions, um, again, it's prefrontal cortex um, where we're reading emotions of other people. Um, oftentimes kids get, they read people wrong, right? Or maybe they are not really sure. And when they're not sure, they tend to make negative assumptions. So this is a famous um, experiment where, you know, you just kind of a neutral face and then you slowly introduce um, a facial expression and then you, you know what is this person feeling it takes adults to typically adults here can you know can say oh this is a sometimes adults say this is a happy person this is a fearful person it takes adolescents much more facial cues they get they need many many more cues to understand what the emotion is and again prefrontal cortex i will say one exception might be kids who um, suffer from, uh, who come from backgrounds of physical abuse because their environment makes them read emotions well, so they actually are really good at it, but otherwise teenagers are not, and they just need more cues to understand what someone else is feeling. And when they don't know what it is, they assume that it is negative. So I always tell pup folks, you might as well be genuine, because even if you are trying to be neutral, kids are going to read you as negative anyway. And I tell this story, we had a staff person at the shelter when I was there and she worked overnight. So she worked the hardest shift. Um, she had the two biggest challenges, getting kids to go to bed and getting kids to get up. Those are the two biggest challenges. And she had to deal with both of those things as, a, you know, working overnights um, full time. And she really prided herself on being just really neutral treating everybody the same way. She really wasn't, she wasn't an emotionally um, demonstrative person anyway. And so she was hard to read because she just always had this really flat affect and kids would fill out the um, exit interview, exit questionnaire um, for us and unsolicited, they would always say that she was their least favorite staff person unsolicited we didn't ask that question but kids would just write that in and it always broke her heart she's like why i treat everybody the same i don't get upset with people i don't get you know i don't play favorites you know so she and it just killed her and and then when i did this training for the very first time i mean you literally saw her face just change because this was it's like the light bulb came on for her because she was neutral and kids read her negatively because of that. And so she became more real with kids. And when she was upset with them, which, you know, that's it, it's easy to get frustrated with kids who won't go to bed or kids who won't get up. <laughs> she, you know, she was real with that. And those statements went away because kids didn't have to guess, they knew. And it was better if they knew, even if it was she was frustrated with them, it was just a better place to be because we don't we don't like um, to the unknown. And so it was easier for them when she actually was genuine. So we might as well be genuine and demonstrate for kids how to handle those negative emotions. I'm really frustrated with you right now. I'm really angry with you right now. I'm not going to scream at you. I might have to go take a break. And then we'll come back and talk about this. But sometimes that's the first time that kids have seen that. So modeling those behaviors, 
helping kids understand what the emotions are. Um, so when I did focus, we would do emotional charades and I just found this, you can find this on, uh, on the internet. I printed it off, cut it up, they'd pull it from an envelope and they'd have to act out these emotions and the other kids would have to guess it. Um, and some of them are hard. You know, I mean, how do you act humiliated? Well, I'd have to think about that one. Um, you know, how do you act helpless? Yeah, some of so some of these are hard, but it just kind of allows them to understand that there are many more emotions than just happy, sad, and mad. Um, and and then kind of it explores that emotional kind of component for them, not only what they're feeling but also what other people are feeling. So it goes both ways. And this does take practice. And I will say that we allow females to, females are better about this because as a society, as a culture, we allow females to express more emotion than we allow males to express emotions. Guys can be happy, but not too happy. Don't be too happy. And guys can be angry. Um, and that's really about it. Yeah, you know, and and this was so screwed up, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, now, females can't be mad because if we're mad, then we're bitches. The you know the B word, sorry. Um, you know, so that's we can't we can't be mad. But you know, there are you know kind of impositions of society around um, emotional expression. But I will say that boys carry that kind of burden a little bit heavier. Um, toxic mas masculinity, absolutely. Um, and even when, and it, it and, and let's recognize that this is a cultural thing, and we can allow our, um, we can create opportunities for our boys to understand, read, and express emotion. Um, but when they go out in the real world, they're still going to be penalized for those types of things. So just recognize that our our young our young uh, men carry that extra responsibility. And then I think it becomes more important that they have a safe person and a safe space to express those, where they don't have to question that. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that that's important. All right. Prefrontal cortex, are, again, the late bloomers responsible for reasoning. And all of this is based upon learning moments. So because this is learned, because this is something that is dependent upon the experiences and their environment, that means that you guys have the opportunity to make a huge impact by providing those thoughtful conversations, by providing those opportunities to fail in a safe space and to figure out how to navigate that by allowing them to think through things, to express themselves, you have the opportunity to make a really, really big impact and promote the, the um, development of the prefrontal cortex, which is really, really good news. Prefrontal cortex is responsible for impulse control. This in and of itself explains a lot of teenage behavior, does it not? <laughs> so if that part of the brain that's the last part to develop is responsible for impulse control and emotion, the part that's responsible for emotion is overactive and ready to go, we get a lot of behavior that if they would think about it, they might not do. What's really interesting is you sit kids down and you think, you know, what did you what did you think was going to happen? Or if you do this, what do you think the consequences? They can tell you all of that, but in the moment when they're experiencing that emotion, if they don't have that neural connection to prefrontal cortex to control that, we still see really stupid uh, behavior. <laughs> it is stupid behavior sometimes. It really is. <laughs> um, and so, and this is going to be true for kids. Who again? This I, I'm. All of this is um, normal adolescent development. Kids who come from supportive backgrounds. When my son was, my oldest was 16, and it was the beginning of it was he was 16. It was the beginning of his um, junior to senior year. He and his friends decided to go uh, three wheeling at 11 o'clock at night. So it was dark, it was out in the country, there were no lights. Um, they were going up hills and, and they put three people on the bike, three people on a three-wheeler. 
all right and they're going uphill now as an adult you go that's not that's not a smart decision that is not what's going to happen to a three-wheeler with three people three big boys on it going uphill what's going to happen it's going to flip right and that's exactly what happened that bike flipped chris was driving um and it flipped and, and so the two boys on the back jumped off that bike was going to fall back on christopher and it was going to crush him and potentially that could have been a life-threatening situation i mean it could have crushed him and he could have died fortunately one of the other boys pushed the bike off of him he did break his wrist um and these were smart kids these were smart kids who came from supportive homes um, who knew better who didn't use prefrontal cortex to make that decision but I, I always say they did use their prefrontal cortex to decide who went to the emergency room with him because they sent the friend that i liked the best because they were all scared to death of what my reaction was going to be <laughs> and so you know they that impulse it, but and as from a point a parent's point of view um you know not using prefrontal cortex to make that decision um but from a parent point of view and an adult point of view with the other boys it was one of the best things that might that could have happened um in terms of their development because they became very very cognizant very aware of potential consequences of behavior and maybe that kept them from doing even more stupid things in, in senior year although i've heard stories that it's not necessarily true all the way um, but they all admit that but they that that stuck with them and it really it was one of those things because it had emotional importance because potentially it could have really really hurt chris it could have killed him um, it stuck with them and it just really solidified that kind of connection once they had a chance to think about it. And once they had, and, and, and I had just really brief conversations with the boys afterwards, um, just to kind of reiterate that, but it really stuck home, it, you know, kind of stuck with them. Like, so we do see, because of this, we see really kind of, um, like I said, stupid behavior. Teenagers do experience thrills um, at more than any other time in, adult, in, in, it, in our lives is that thrill-seeking behavior. And you couple that with the reward center that's in the, in the midbrain that's fully active and fully functioning. And this idea that it can't happen to me. And boy, oh boy, does that not explain a lot of behavior. That we see from kids a lot of these really stupid behaviors um, so what can we do well we can provide them with safe thrills we can kind of and again those teaching moments those kind of conversations that we have with them the dopamine uh, it's called the dopamine reward center in the in the limbic system is um, active it's going to really really um, have a significance in terms of creating learning moments for us. So when we can provide those moments that are rewarding for kids, that help them learn that experience, um, it's going to stick with them longer. And we can do this by providing um, recreational activities. I know you guys can't take them to Kings Island or to any amusement parks because that's a liability nightmare that I would never ever recommend. <laughs> But you still can provide them with, you know, fun things to do, things that they like to do, recreation that, that that's physical as well. Um, anything that's new also will kind of help us pay attention. It gets our attention um, and triggers that kind of activity in the midbrain. Um, and so introducing them to new things or even during focus, um, just pushing them again safely, just a little bit beyond that comfort zone. It triggers that activity in the prefrontal or in the limbic system. Um, and then we introduce skills while we're doing that. And it creates that pathway to the prefrontal cortex, um, which again is one of the reasons why I really liked doing focus because it allowed me opportunities to do all this stuff, to provide them with new ways of thinking about things, to, to safely push them beyond their comfort zone so that they could learn new skills um, and and really, really enhance the development of prefrontal cortex. 
prefrontal cortex is also, I mean, you have to get the idea that this is a, a really important part of the brain, right? Because it helps to determine right from wrong, cause and effect, and making sound judgments. And let's remember that this doesn't fully develop in supportive environments until the mid 20s um, and sometimes even late 20s. So, you know, there were times when I was the assistant director that I had to have conversations with staff members about some of the decisions that they made. So uh, Vicki says, okay, <laughs> Vanessa's computer dried. <laughs> um, so there were there were times that I had to have, you know, conversations with staff members. I remember having a particular conversation with a staff member. It was a part-time um, weekend staff member who thought it would be a good idea to let the kids play hide and seek outside at night. Yeah, Vicki's going, oh, that was my reaction too. I had to have a conversation with a staff member who forgot their phone and drove the van with kids in it to their house to pick up the phone and left the van running when they went into the house. I'm like, oh my God, okay. So, <laughs> some of you are going, oh my God, you're absolutely horrified. These were smart young adults, again, making sometimes decisions that we had to have conversations about just to, again, kind of what, you know, what could have happened? You know, what do you, th you know, what were possible consequences? And just kind of think through those things. Um, and so we, we will still see some really ju questionable judgments and behaviors, even, you know, well into the 20s. That's just in the 20s. So kids, you know, are going, they're all learning this stuff. They're still trying to figure their way around this stuff. And because they don't have this fully developed, um, they will kind of see things very black and white. They tend to have, teenagers tend to be very idealistic um, and have a sense that the world should be this should be this way. And when it doesn't, something's mm -hmm. wrong. Um, and so they have a strong belief in individual rights, which makes sense, right? Because they're focused on autonomy and independence. They're very, very quick to see the inconsistencies in our behavior as adults and fail to see the inconsistencies in their own behaviors. Again, because you know it's easy to see something outside than to look in um, because they understand that there are multiple ways to do this as cognitive development happens. They will question why we do things the way that we do. And, it is a um, developmental research fact that seeing gray, that ability to see gray and not black and white doesn't really fully develop until that emerging adulthood stage. So not even really until like 18, 19, 20, up to 24, you know, that's when we really begin to understand that the world is not black and white that there are gray areas and you know and things change depending upon the situation so these are all things that they have to learn they're very stuck in that you know you guys you guys ever hear it's not fair that's not fair that's not it's because they're very stuck in black and white they're very stuck in this this is the concrete way that it should be because they have that difficulty seeing gray areas so the more that we can talk them through this stuff again, the more that we're gonna be able to develop that prefrontal cortex. Um, and we can do this by, you know, again, remember it's excitatory. So let's use this to, you know, to gear them toward social activity, you know, socially responsible activities. We can do things like community service projects or service learning projects. Again, that different, you know, as an adult, walking that thin line between idealism and realism um, and making sure that we maintain that excitement for kids without bursting their bubble. Um, that's our responsibility, but we do that again through those questioning, the questioning that we can, you know, that we do with kids, um, build empathy, so help them step into other people's shoes and focus is a really, really good way of doing this. One of my favorite things to do as a clinician 
was to have if the young person was having a really really difficult um, relationship with someone have them you know see it from the other person's point of view so i would play the kid and they would play the adult they would play the teacher they would play the parent they would play the staff member whatever it was and then we work through that and that creates that that um, empathy and that creates again that other perspective by helping them they understand that there are lots of different ways to do this um, so when we are asking them to do it one way we better have a really good reason for that um, to be able to explain that all right so we do see again still poor decision making very very inconsistent behavior depending upon their age and the best way to demonstrate this inconsistent behavior is through this youtube video I use this a lot um, and so these are i'm going to preface this these are college kids they're college young adults <laughs> I could say kids because I'm old enough to. Um, and they are college, so they're college cheerleaders, which means that they've got their stuff together, right? Because you have to be able to maintain your grades to do this extracurricular activity that demands a lot of time. So these are kids who have it together and they do stuff like this. <laughs> Just play it again. Watch this. What you miss is her saying, Do you think this is going to work? Which I'm always like, If you, if you have to, probably not a good idea. What you also don't see is she hit her head on the way down. I don't know if it plays, but if you play this further, you know, she'll hold her head. The guys are so busy celebrating that they fail to recognize that she hit her head on the way down. One guy goes over and says, are you okay? She goes, I think so. And then he goes and chest bumps the other guy. So he goes back to celebrating. Again, college age, young adults who have lots of skills, um, but the potential for what could have gone wrong in this scenario is mind boggling. And so you still get kids who will, young people, um, young adults who will still make fairly bonehead decisions. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Questionable decisions because, oh shoot, that's not what I wanted to do. Just like um, toddlers, they need to learn this stuff in multiple settings. Repetition is really, really important um, in adolescence just like it is in infancy and toddlerhood they are not very good at learning something with in one setting and being able to translate that into another setting so we may work with them at you may work with them at the shelter and you know and maybe it's on like you know something like respectful communication or how to control their you know negative emotions and they get really good at it with us and then they go to school and blow up because they're not very good at transferring skills from one setting to another and so that repetition in multiple settings is going to be really really important to be able to kind of, again work with parents like you know we would have kids do really really well in the shelter and then they would go home and things would just blow up and so it's important to work with people and, and, and you know and the adults in all of those settings to reinforce that to be able to help establish national nat, natural not national natural consequences um and so sometimes sometimes they just they just work out they're you know a natural consequence you don't have to you know really do anything else with the example that i used with christopher and the three-wheeler um you know I didn't have to do anything else. He broke his wrist and he was in a cast for six weeks. That was his summer. That was really his summer. He couldn't go swimming. There were so many different things that he couldn't do, things that he couldn't do with his friends. 
Um, and so that was a really natural consequence. My second son, who was um, in advanced classes all through elementary and junior high, got to high school and his first report card he brought home, he had D's and F's and he handed it to me and I looked at it and I handed it back and I said, what happened? What, what, <laughs> what is this? And he said to me, well, I've been, I was on the phone with my girlfriend and I didn't get my homework done. I just because I was on the phone with her and so I didn't have time to do homework. Well, a very natural consequence then for, is for him to lose some phone time. Actually, he didn't even lose phone time. At 8.30, he was off the phone, so he had time to do homework. Uh, that was a really natural consequence, and he brought his grades up. So sometimes they will actually just really be there. Um, and and if you're not certain, talk to the kids about it. When kids can come up with their own consequences, it is amazing how well they will abide by those. Now, my second son also decided um, to pull a prank his senior year. And he knew, I mean, the, the rule of my house was if you get in trouble at school, you get in, tr if you get in trouble at home. Um, he knew that. He also knew that if he pulled a prank, he would get in trouble because the principal had, it was a new principal, and he had kind of said this to the seniors. Um, it was something that was, didn't hurt anybody. He just, when they, they did the awards and his name was called and he was walking up to get his award, he had a friend in a gorilla outfit who ran out through Rye over his shoulder and carried him out of the room with Riley calling, help, I have no bananas. And everybody laughed about it and it was a big deal, but the principal was not gonna let him walk at graduation because of this. That was not a natural consequence. <laughs> a natural consequence was while he was, and, and what ended up happening is he got three days in school suspension, um, which meant he was grounded at home. And that was a natural consequence. He was totally okay with that because he knew what was, he knew he was gonna be in trouble and he was willing to, he was willing to pay the price for his little prank. So when you can get their buy-in, consequences become so much easier. Um, and ask them, it, sometimes it does. If you know that kids are having trouble with a particular, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, getting along with the teacher or, you know, whatever it is, it's getting along with parents, maybe it is negotiating, um, you know, saying no with their peer groups, you can have them actually write those out for you and in focus you role play those so those targeted scenarios if you have a group of kids that's really struggling in the shelter um, communicating respectfully with one another then you can write scenarios that work on that skill and have them practice that um, during focus and i always tell you know you guys that Teenagers are going to complain about focus. They're going to complain about role plays um, every time. Just get used to it. But if you remember those mirror neurons, if you're excited about it, they get excited about it as well. And so, you know, I had a staff person who hated doing focus, and I would, and and he just didn't do focus because we actually changed the time that focus happened because he would go in and go, okay, guys it's time to do focus let's get this done do you think those kids got anything out of that absolutely not but i had another staff member who loved to do actually i had several who really really loved to do focus i like to do focus myself um and when you get excited about it they get excited about it as well so they will complain but oftentimes when you're role playing those targeted scenarios that are real to them that have meaning to them then they're going to really get into it and they learn a lot from that. Um, and there were there were a lot of times that the kids weren't ready to stop focus when it was over just because we got we really got into it. Um, and so take advantage of that. Take advantage of your passion um, and use things that are meaningful to them to get that lesson across. All right, so we're getting close to the end. I want to talk about some general implications around adolescence and brain development. Um, it is really, really important to encourage healthy sleep habits. And teenagers have different sleep cycles than adults do. Um, typically speaking, the all of the, the triggers in the brain that cause you to get sleepy, so melatonin, your body temperature drops, 
Um, all of that stuff doesn't happen until two hours later for teenagers. Um, so they're not even really ready to go to sleep and not even sleepy until about 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, and unfortunately, we have to get them up at what, six o'clock to get them off to, well, when, they're, when they go to school, we have to get them up early so that they can have time to get ready, breakfast, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, when we can't let them get their nine and a half hours that they need, and that's what adolescents need is nine and a half hours of sleep, um, then you can allow makeup sleep. So we would always let them sleep late in on late on the weekends. This stuff can be shared with kids. All of this stuff that I've talked with you in terms of brain development, the effects, um, all of the changes can be shared with the kids because when they know this information, particularly when they know information about the things that get in the way of, pro of brain development, um, you know, they can, we can help avoid them. We can introduce coping skills to reduce stress. Um, we can tell them about the consequences of introducing substances um, during this critical adolescent brain period. So share that 15, um, 5, 15, 25 rule. You guys remember it? Who remembers the 5, 15, 25 rule? Come on, somebody remembers it, don't They're you? five times more likely to get addicted if they start at 15 rather than 25. Yes, thank you. Is that Lauren? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I only see it as like a small group of folks. I didn't see, but I, I recognize your voice. Thank you, yes. So share this information with them. And then of course we have the opportunity to help you know introduce those coping skills how to relax i mean you know breathing makes a difference and if we if we teach them nothing else teach them how to deep breathe because that does turn off that um, stress response and will help calm us down so just deep breathing which is belly breathing and the key with deep breathing is that you do it for at least 90 seconds 90 seconds is typically what we need to do to change brain patterns. So deep breathing for 90 seconds and your exhale is longer than your inhale. And those are, that's it. That's the key factors for deep breathing. At least 90 seconds with your exhale being longer than your inhale. And that will turn off that stress response. It will allow them to access prefrontal cortex. Um, so, you know, lots of things that we can help introduce those. Um, I have, uh, I think some of you guys participated in the um, staff development retreat that we had virtually back in October, where I did a, a workshop on, on, on those types of strategies um, to help build resilience. And, and they're all easy to do. Um, so if you guys want more information, Vicki can let me know about that, but just share this information with them. So here are some of my resources, um, not nearly as many as I use. I have a lot more, I probably need to update this, but we have uh, some time if you guys have questions. If not, I am, this is, I'm done. That's my <laughs> presentation. I wanna thank you guys for allowing me to share this information with you. Um, if you didn't pick up with your mirror neurons, I really like this stuff. I think it's super important. It explains so much. And I think it allows us as adults to interact more appropriately um, with kids when we know this and we can structure our activities and our interactions really with the purpose of developing that prefrontal cortex and allowing kids um, to have opportunities to learn to do that. Do we have questions? You guys can unmute or use the chat. Just thanks for the emphasis on mirror neurons. We uh, like them over here. <laughs> <laughs> They're so important and we can use them to our advantage. I don't have a question, but as a first timer, I really enjoyed the presentation, so thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, that's good to hear. All right. Well, I don't have anything else. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.